can begin. Um, start out with a, a quick introduction. So welcome to the SEC VSCC webinar about uh, introduction to Azure. So we have Andy Howard, who's both part of the SEC and VSCC uh, organizing committee and also a product manager for Microsoft Azure. So he knows, uh, knows Azure inside and out and uh, <laughs> has been uh, instrumental in the, the cloud component of um, SEC competitions for SEC, uh, SEC for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I at least know the Azure parts that I work with. It's, uh, <laughs> I would not <laughs> claim to be an expert in some of our other areas, but yeah, awesome. Thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah, happy to be here today. So um, <clears throat> as Steve said, my name is Andy Howard. I'm a program manager on the Azure HPC software and services team. Um, I focus primarily on things like our scheduler integration, both with third-party schedulers, such as all the major ones you've probably heard of, you know, in no particular order, Slurm, PBS, Grid Engine, LSF, HT Condor, um, but then also integration with our first party schedulers, such as Azure Batch Scheduler and um, uh, HPC Pack. Um, I just want to start out by saying, you know, I don't really, I'm not a sales guy, I'm an engineer by trade, so I, I don't really like giving just PowerPoint presentations. I like having more interactive discussions and things like that. So as questions come up, if there's anything that doesn't make sense, you know, I have the chat open, I can monitor that, but then also feel free to just come off of mute and ask the question. Um, it's not, this isn't some like well-rehearsed presentation. Um, to Steve's point earlier, we are recording and we'll put the recording in these slides on the webinars page later. And then we will have, as we get a little bit closer to uh, when you get access to your cloud environments, we will have follow-up tutorials and, and webinars to actually help you get started with some of that. So today's presentation, is really meant to be more of a uh, an overview of the HPC platform and software and services that we have on Azure. So any questions before we jump in there? And if any of you do happen to see me in person at SE, we're just gonna pretend that this is what I still look like today. Uh, I've been doing this for, I've been doing HPC for about 15 years now um, and have a lot of experience both with cloud HPC, but then also, um, you know, tr more traditional on-premises HPC. So I got, um, I actually got my start in HPC in part because of the student cluster competition and competed um, on the Purdue team for I think the first three years of the competition. All right, so jumping into the agenda, if there's no other questions, um, <clears throat> you know, basically an overview of HPC on Azure. Um, that's going to be the bulk of this presentation. Towards the end, we'll get into, um, you know, budgets and access and quotas and things like that, and then we'll just open it up for some general uh, Q and A. If there's anything that pops into people's minds. So, what is HPC on Azure? So, Azure is really, um, at least as far as my team's concerned, um, we are a cloud that's built for HPC. A lot of cloud providers will um, oftentimes include some HPC components um, or some HPC offerings as part of their portfolio. Um, we have an entire team that's dedicated to designing hardware, designing the software um, to make all of this easier. So everything from um, you know, purpose-built servers that are designed from the ground up with HPC use cases in mind. These aren't just high-end servers that you can do HPC on. We actually build them with specific capabilities and you'll see when we get to some of those offerings, um, what exactly that means and looks like. Um, we are the only public cloud provider with InfiniBand. Um, and so that's a really big uh, key to enabling some of these really, really large scale workloads. Um, high performance storage, both from uh, an IaaS type approach. So you've got storage uh, VMs with a lot of disks attached to them, a lot of um, low latency disk attached to them, but then also very scalable storage services such as Azure Blob Storage, Azure NetApp Files, um, and even at the more extreme ends of things, the Cray Cluster Store. And then workload orchestration, and this is the piece that um, my specific team focuses on. And this is really just, uh, you know, as we start to dig into what, the, what it's possible to do on Azure, um, the overlap of HPC and the rest of Azure can get can become pretty daunting. 
Um, and, and there's a lot of times some questions around how do I even get started with this or what components do I need to piece together to build and run my HPC workloads. And so we do have an entire team that's just focused on the workload orchestration. That's everything from um, data movement or spinning up and spinning down VMs to control cost, um, ensuring that companies are operating within you know, their own policies and compliance guidelines. This is a little less important for the things that you guys are gonna be doing. These are all open source codes, open data. So it's not as, as important, but when you start talking about, let's say a Fortune 100 company that's doing all of their financial risk analysis on Azure, those policies start to become pretty important. So you know, one of the, the design principles that we take is we start to look at where our HPC capabilities land within the overall landscape is we wanna make sure that we're enabling workloads at any scale. So I absolutely have customers today um, and have had customers for a while that run what a lot of people would consider pretty small workloads, right? A couple of servers, um, you know, they may even be able to run this in a closet on-prem, but they don't wanna have to deal with some of the other compliance and regulation things that Azure helps them solve. So everything from a handful of cores, even single core workloads, all the way up to, you know, we do support, uh, you won't have access to this for the competition, but we do have you know, full-blown Cray supercomputers that are built in Azure. Um, our largest scale AI and ML workload uh, clusters are um, on the top 500 list, uh, which we'll see a little bit later in the presentation. So everything from small scale to large scale is possible. Um, for the, uh, the majority of today's talk, we're gonna focus mostly on these, I don't think you guys can see my cursor. Yeah, pull up the laser pointer here. We're going to focus on these uh, specialized VMs, particularly the HNN. Um, when it comes to the competition itself, uh, you guys will have access to some of these other uh, resources, uh, especially as you request them. So DE and F are going to be kind of the most common um, VM sizes that you will use in addition to the specialty SKUs. Um, and sorry, I just used a term there. So we generally refer, at least on the engineering side, to our VM sizes as a SKU. Uh, so if you hear me say that, that's all I'm saying is a specific VM size or family. Um, so you can see kind of, kind of descriptions here for what each of the letters kind of stand for. So, you know, D-series is standard workloads. You know, think you're run of the mill. If you went to Dell and bought a server or HP and bought a server, um, this is kind of what your default configuration is going to be. Um, and then some uh, variants of those that are targeted for workloads that may need a little bit more memory or maybe a little bit more compute bound. And then as you start to move up the stack, you know, our LNM series are targeted more towards workloads that need uh, a lot of disk IO. So I think if you're building, you know, a parallel file system in Azure, um, you might need, you know, super low latency, high IOPS um, from your hard drives. If you're running something like a, an SAP instance, uh, for anybody who's familiar with SAP, you might need some really extreme memory. And in this case, I'm talking upwards of, you know, 50, 60 terabytes of memory in a VM. <clears throat> and then on the specialty VM side, uh, we've got quite a few different options here. And I'm going to dig into some of these in just a second. As I mentioned earlier, one of the key, differenti key differentiators uh, between us and some of the other cloud providers is that we do have um, InfiniBand networking on all of our specialty SKUs. And so this really uh, helps us get super low latency, uh, super scalable communication and run some of these uh, you know, the highest end MPI workloads that we're seeing. So which VMs actually have InfiniBand and what are their capabilities? So um, there's kind of two main families here, and actually I should have caught this slide. This isn't really the differentiator between HP and HC. It, it's true today, but it's not why they're designed the way they are. Um, the HP series is targeted towards workloads that are really, uh, really have memory or have the need for um, higher memory bandwidth. Um, and the HC series, and so that's why the, the B is there, high bandwidth. The HC series is for workloads that uh, really are compute bound. So they need kind of the, uh, the fastest clock speed. Um, 
and, and things like that. So it just so happens today that HP series is all AMD hardware, HP series is Intel hardware, but that may change in the future. So I just want to call that out. So if we take a look at them, you know, other than what we've kind of optimized the server design for and the workflow, they're fairly similar in terms of um, their actual specs and functionality. Um, you can see here the biggest differences are around the CPUs that are in them and the memory bandwidth. Um, you'll see also HP series, we have up to 200 gig uh, HDR infinite band. That's mostly because we haven't really turned the crank on a new version of the, the HC series to, to incorporate some of the newer infinite band technology. Um, in terms of scaling applications, um, we've scaled the HP, not the HP V1, but the, the later um, offerings that we'll get to in a minute. Um, we've scaled these up to and beyond 80,000 cores. Um, HC series, we're still kind of at a maximum of around, max around 20,000 cores. And that's mostly due to the fact that the HC series um, only has 44 cores per VM. The HP series goes up to 120 cores per VM. So we can get a lot greater core density in HB than we can in HC. Um, and then both of those come with a certain amount of local um, SSD, but then also um, accelerated networking connections to Azure Premium Storage. So a lot of storage offerings there as well. Any questions on the distinction between HB and HC or you know, maybe why you would choose one over the other? Would, would cost be a factor in that, Andy? Um, it can, definitely, um, especially as you look at the fact that HC series is now, oh man, three years old. Um, and the HB series, the latest HB V3 uh, was launched this summer. And so with each one of those revisions, uh, we try and get the costs per core lower and lower and lower. Um, and the big reason for that is we're trying to be cost competitive with on-premises systems. Um, so yeah, that is definitely going to be a factor. However, uh, one key thing, and this is kind of a strategy thing to look at, um, just because the VM itself is cheaper or the cores are cheaper does not mean you'll necessarily get the best cost performance. So it really makes a lot of sense, especially when you're testing, um, to do that analysis. I've seen some workloads um, particularly if they can't take advantage of the higher memory bandwidth on HB, but can take advantage of the, the faster clock speeds on the HC, you know, the HC series may run twice as fast um, and may only increase the cost by, for example, a third of the cost. Um, and so that's, that's a big payoff there to be able to get the work done faster, uh, maybe for just a little bit more money, or in some cases, get it faster and actually for cheaper. Thanks. Yep. Great question. One, one quick question, sorry, on that slide. Yeah. Um, so since the HC series are older, I mean, just looking at raw teraflops, it looks like HB is still higher performance. So is that is that because where we are in the release cycle, you expect newer yeah, HC Yeah, it, it, it can be. Um, again, it really comes down to the workload. So there are some workloads that will not see higher performance from HB. Um, even with some of the other advancements that are in there versus the, the uh, these are uh, Xeon uh, Skylake series, I believe. And so you still, there are still some workloads that absolutely will just run faster on HC series. Okay, thanks. Yep, it's a really good question though. Um, and so just to kind of look at as we scale this up, like how does Azure actually start to compare to, let's say, a, a traditional uh, on-premises HPC supercomputer? So this was a study that we did with University of Illinois um, and the, the NAMD development team, actually. And they did scaling studies both on Azure and on Frontera. And if you see here, um, you know, compared to Frontera, which is a you know, top 10 supercomputer in the world, or at least was at the time we did this, um, we can actually run, uh, not, I guess, about a third of the um, or 33% faster than they were seeing on-premises. Um, and so that's kind of a, a really big deal for us. And again, as we start to scale out these workloads, um, this is uh, one of the, the reasons why we design the hardware the way that we do. Um, this is just another use case where we're looking at, um, again, HPv2, 
um, compared to um, compared to Cheyenne at NCAR. Um, and this was running WARF. This is one of those cases that we've actually run WARF up to and beyond 80,000 MPI ranks. Um, and this was all the way back in February of 2020. So as you can imagine, we've we kind of grown a little bit more since then too, but we're still seeing for the most part, the largest MPI jobs are right around 80,000 cores. And that's largely just due to the, the core density that we have today. So just this summer, um, we did announce HBV3. So it's the newer generation of uh, Milan processors. We actually launched it right uh, this, the same day that Milan was announced to the world. Um, and so even from HBV2, the previous generation that we again had just rolled out uh, about six months before we announced and launched HBV3 in private preview, uh, we saw a 20% performance improvement. Um, so same cost per VM, um, but faster performance. And there's a few other things with HBV3 that um, provide some benefit to customers. They may or may not help you in the competition, but it's something that's worth looking at. So one of the things as we design all of our HPC uh, VM sizes in Azure that we try and focus on is um, for HPC workloads and research workloads, things like hyperthreading generally don't provide any performance benefit and in fact can, can cause a bunch of issues. And so one of the things usually in the cloud that happens as you start to provide smaller VM sizes is you'll hold, you, you basically start carving up the VM into smaller chunks and then splitting those across your customers. So you, you know, say you have a, a 20 core VM, you may have one customer that requests a five core VM from that and another one that, you know, five more customers that request one core VMs. And the issue when you start to do that is that um, you start to affect the placement of those cords, of those cores in relation to how they're attached to memory and the interconnect. Uh, for any of you who have taken computer architecture classes, this wasn't as important as we had single core machines in the past, and even dual core wasn't a huge issue. But now when you start talking about, you know, 120 cores that are split, split across six different memory controllers, um, that becomes a bit of an issue when you start to carve up and split these things, because you may have more hops to get to your memory, and you really don't want to have to deal with that. So with all of our H series, and I believe at least all of our, uh, the, the largest N series, um, we can actually offer um, core pinning that's really passed through to the underlying hardware. So if you tell your code, for example, pin this process to core zero in the VM, it will literally be pinned to core zero in the actual underlying server. For a lot of cloud providers, a lot of hypervisors, um, they don't do that and they actually abstract away the virtual core from the physical core. Now, what we've found is this is really great for workloads that are using the entire VM and can use the, can use the entire VM. Um, but we have some customers and some codes that really don't benefit from that. Um, it may be due to memory bandwidth needs, it may be due to storage needs, or in a lot of cases, it's down to um, the licensing costs. So for example, let's say I'm an ANSYS customer, but I only have enough licenses to run a job uh, using you know, 16 cores per VM at the scale that I need. Well, I don't wanna have to be the one who has to request a full 120 core VM and then figure out, okay, what's the underlying NUMA architecture? How do I make sure that my processes are pinned in an optimal way? So with HPV3, we actually offer partial VM sizes. And what you'll notice here is the only thing that changes between these is the number of cores that are actually exposed to your VM. Um, you still get the entire VM. So you still have um, all of the memory available. So you'll see RAM per core starts to go up because it's still got the same total memory, but the memory bandwidth and RAM per core goes up because you don't have as many cores fighting for those resources. Um, the reason why I say this may not be that helpful for the competition is a standard HB120 V3 is the same price as the HB120 16 V3. So the 16 core version costs just as much as the 120 core version. But depending on how you're trying to optimize your workloads, it may still make sense for you to go with uh, one of these smaller options because we'll do that uh, the withholding of the additional cores in an intelligent way. <clears throat> 
Does that make sense? I know this one took me a little while to wrap my head around when we first announced it, but. All right, cool. Um, and so this is just another, I'm not gonna go in this one in depth, but this is just another slide that summarizes kind of the difference between the VM types. So this can be useful when you start to um, start to try and plan your strategies for what you wanna test out. HPV3 is not on here just because it's, it's newer than this slide was. So um, that's the CPU heavy um, side of things. Let's shift gears just a little bit and talk about the GPU offerings because I know for a lot of these workloads, um, that's where people are really interested. Um, so we've got everything in terms of GPUs from visualization all the way to deep learning and AI um, and everything in between. And so you'll see that we have a few different uh, VM families similar to what we did on the CPU side. Um, in V, it, it's, you know, in really just denotes that it's a GPU VM. And then the letter after the N is kind of telling you what it's designed for. So whether it's visualization, uh, compute for more traditional HPC workloads, and then uh, D for deep learning. We're starting to see a lot more HPC applications come over to this side. Uh, and you'll see why in a minute. It's mo mostly down to the GPUs that are being deployed as part of this. Uh, for the most part in this competition, you'll probably be dealing primarily with NC and ND. Um, I thought I pulled this slide out. This is just talking about visualization GPUs. Um, so let's talk about the, the GPU enabled VMs for compute purposes. So one of the things that, and one of the reasons why a lot of customers come to Azure for GPU computing is that um, the AI workloads and HPC workloads are continuously evolving, but also the hardware is coming out at just a ridiculously quick rate, right? Um, just a couple of years ago, um, the latest and greatest was something like an NVIDIA V100 or P100. Uh, now we're all the way up to the A100 and we've gone from, you know, maybe one to four GPUs in a VM um, that could do some pretty heavyweight you know, processing, um, but now we're all the, way, all the way up to, you know, eight way a100 VMs. Um, obviously, the more GPUs you add, the faster the GPUs are, the more they cost. But you know, it it saves you that um, that upfront investment, especially if you're just trying to evaluate workloads. Um, you know, one of these eight-way A100 boxes, I can't even imagine what you're talking about in terms of the uh, the cost to to buy something like that. You're talking, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and here you can rent it for something like forty dollars an hour. And get access to that full, you know, eight-way A100 um, VM. And so again, you know, you guys can go through these slides later, but it's really just kind of coming down to what are you trying to accomplish um, that's going to determine which GPUs you actually land on. Um, we also have the the NC V3, NCT4 V3, which is um, a, a uh, one of our deep learning offerings with the, the NVIDIA T4 GPU. So this is really focused on tensor processing units and not just a general GPU that's been um, repurposed or used for um, AI and ML use cases. I don't think that this will necessarily play into um, any of the codes that you guys are using today, but again, it's, it's still um, something to be aware of. And then as I was mentioning, the latest and greatest um, that we have in terms of the GPU compute side is the NDV4. This is an eight-way A100 box. Um, earlier this summer, when the top 500 list came out in June, we actually had four of our production clusters uh, placed in the top 30 of that list. So I think it's numbers, clusters 20, uh, systems 26 through 29 um, are all Microsoft Azure uh, clusters. Um, and so that's kind of the scale that we're able to accomplish with these workloads is the, this isn't just a, you know, a toy. This is a real, you know, first in class um, HPC system that you can rent time on. And this is, I'm not going to get into specifics here unless anybody has questions about the NDV4. Well, one quick question about the GPUs. So mm -hmm. they're they're single tenant. It's like you rent the entire GPU. They're not virtualized, um, or if they're virtualized, just for security and other kinds of reasons, but not for sharing. 
Correct, yes. Yeah, as with our other HPC offerings, um, that, that changes a little bit on the visualization side. We do have some SKUs that we carve up the GPU for virtual desktops. Um, but in general, if you're requesting, you know, especially the full size VM things, you are not sharing GPUs with other users. You are you're you have that full dedicated access. Okay, thanks. Um, that's another important point with the NDV4, especially as you can imagine, as you start to put eight A100 GPUs in a server, um, keeping those GPUs fed, especially in a multi VM scenario, can be uh, can take quite a lot of bandwidth, not just in terms of memory, but also the interconnect. So for the uh, NDV4, um, each GPU has its own dedicated 200 gig um, InfiniBand link. And so that's really important as we start to scale these boxes up so that you can keep the work uh, and the compute happening and not be waiting on data transfer between them. Thanks. Um, this is another slide that I like to include in here. Um, I haven't updated this for NDV4, um, but it's a really great, this is kind of how we look at for different workload types, you know, what offerings should I start looking at um, to, to uh, test the performance of. And so this can be useful as you start to look at um, the different codes that you're going to have to run, you know, what, which GPUs may be best suited for that. So that covers most of the, uh, the hardware platform sides. I'm happy to just pause there and see if there's any more questions about the hardware that's available, what may or may not be available for the competition, those types of things. I suspect for a lot of teams, there'll be a lot to be gained by going back and uh, pouring closely over those tables midway through with the different, different instances and uh, capabilities. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and the product pages for each of those also has even more detail, both around um, the, the VM's capabilities, but then also things like blog posts or codes that we may have already scaled and, and shown perform really well on those VM types. All right, so I'll go ahead and jump into the uh, HPC software platform side. Um, some of this is really just information for you in general on HPC on Azure. Um, for the competition, we'll be you know, sticking with one particular technology, which I'll get to in a second, um, but wanted to kind of give the, the high level overview of what's available today. Um, so depending on the workload you're trying to run and the, the production scenario that you have in mind, um, your needs will change depending on whether you have um, legacy job schedulers that you're bringing along. Maybe it's a net new workflow and you really just kind of want to be able to interact with it uh, with a, a REST API or a Python API. Um, or maybe you have an you know, existing, in the case of HPC pack, an existing scheduler on-premises today that you're already running HPC pack on and now you just want to start bursting into the cloud. Um, so that's where, why you see a bunch of different offerings here. And then obviously as containerized workflows uh, become more and more popular. We see a lot more growth in um, Azure Kubernetes service. Um, for the purposes of the competition, you guys will be using Azure Cycle Cloud, and there, we'll get into the reasons why we've kind of chosen that as the main platform. But essentially, it operates the most um, like a traditional HPC cluster. So if you have access to your institution's um, HPC clusters today, you'll have a very similar experience when you work with Azure Cycle Cloud, at least in terms of submitting and running jobs. Um, this is kind of the marketing level slide for what Cycle Cloud enables, but essentially you can think of Cycle Cloud as a tool to enable you to take a traditional HPC cluster along with the job scheduler that you're, you may already be used to, such as Slurm or LSF or Grid Engine, and deploy that same architecture on top of Azure without having to worry about the complexity of, okay, when I build a cluster, I'm gonna need a scheduler node. So I'll deploy that VM and then I'm gonna need a network card that goes with that and assign an IP address. And now I need to attach some disks. Okay, that's my scheduler. Now I need to go and configure some compute nodes. 
and do the same thing with them, give them an IP address range or subnet, pick the VM type, um, you know, pick the image that I want to use with that, do the actual configuration to get the compute nodes to join the scheduler, which is a task in and of itself, but then also make the decision, do I need more compute nodes? Do I not have enough work to do? So maybe I need to be shutting things down. All of that gets really, really complex when you're running in the cloud. And if you're not designing for that, you're really not taking advantage of the things like the, the ability to shut off things you aren't using to save costs. Um, so Psycho Cloud gives you an easy way to do that without having to really think about some of the Azure specifics. And like I said, we'll get into um, a webinar later and tutorials on using Psycho Cloud and how you interact with it. But once the cluster is up and running, it acts just like a traditional HPC cluster. So you log in to the, the scheduler or the login node and you run jobs the same way that you would on-prem using like sbatch or um, QSub or, or BSub, depending on what scheduler you're using. Um, one of the, a few of the other things that are the reason why we have used CycleCloud in the past for this competition is it does provide uh, automatic error handling and detection. So at the end of the day, these compute nodes are physical resources running in our data centers, right? There's no, everyone likes to talk about the magic of the cloud and oh, it's in, infallible. That's not true, right? At the end of the day, this is real hardware that's running and sometimes hardware fails. Sometimes the software deployment fails. Um, you know, sometimes there's just a freak occurrence and you know, maybe in the region that you're running in or the cluster that you've been placed on, there's not quite enough capacity to handle your auto scale requests. So CycleCloud handles the retry and handling of, of a lot of those errors for you. And in the cases where it can't, it helps provide you know, kind of more um, obvious reasons for the error instead of just a stack trace that gets dumped out. And then the other really key part for the competition itself is you guys are gonna have budgets. Um, you know, for the, the in-person competition, traditionally the limiting factor on your cluster is a power window. So you get, you know, what is it, 26 amps or 30 amps of power and that's it. In the cloud, the, the, uh, the operating window that you have is really a, a monetary budget. So for the competition, you guys will have a monetary budget and it's gonna be up to you to not go over that. Um, we're not gonna turn stuff off for you. You're gonna have to turn it off or else you're gonna get penalized. Um, so PsychoCloud provides a really great real-time uh, way for us to monitor the cost and set alerts to keep you from going over. And again, we'll get into those specific details when we do the PsychoCloud webinar later on. Um, again, this is just kind of highlighting the different schedulers that we have support for. Um, you don't have to use a scheduler, any of our scheduler integration with PsychoCloud if you don't want to. I would suggest that you do just because for auto scale purposes, it will help you out quite a bit. If there's no jobs in the queue, CycleCloud will start to shut things down. Um, and as jobs come in, it will turn them on for you. So you don't have a job sitting in queue and find out five hours later, oh man, I forgot to start compute nodes for that. Um, so I do recommend, you know, if you have a, a scheduler that your institution favors over some of the others, you know, use what you're comfortable with. Um, note that a few of these do have license, license requirements. So you're probably not gonna be using IBM's LSF or Symfony schedulers. Um, you're primarily gonna be looking at Slurm, PBS and Grid Engine. Any questions about the software side before we get into the last part of the prepared webinar? All right, so uh, the thing that you're probably all wondering, how much money do we get and when do we get access to it? <laughs> this is the, the part that always yeah. is my pain. Um, so in terms of how the budgets are gonna work, um, leading up to the competition, you guys will get, um, there'll be a, it says for each month, but there'll basically be a few testing windows that you'll have access to your clusters and um, you'll have an assigned budget for that window. Um, that, those budgets won't be as large as the budget that you get for the actual competition. Um, they may change to, you know, between the different testing windows. So it may be the first window is you know, 
a certain amount of money. I'm just going to use a completely made up number here. Don't take this as any indication of what you're going to get, but it may be $10 for the first window. It may be 30 for the second window, and it may be a hundred for the competition, for example, um, depending on, you know, how testing's going, how much teams have been using, uh, we may increase the budget for the second window. We may keep it the same. Um, so it's just going to be something that uh, we'll announce it as we get to each of the testing windows. Um, I've included here kind of two great ways as you start to look at CycleCloud to um, figure out what the cluster is going to cost cost you. So the first one and the easiest one I think to navigate or at least get a, a sense of what does this cost me, you know, per hour per core is inside of CycleCloud, when you choose the different VM types uh, for it to build, to build your cluster from, there is this cost breakdown. Well, it's really a feature breakdown, but one of the features that we highlight is the cost per hour for the whole VM, and then also the cost per hour per core of the VM. Um, you can also see how much quota you have, you know, what's still available based off of what's running. And then uh, low priority, it's, it's not called low priority more, anymore, it's called spot. But that's another option to save cost. You could see up to, um, in some cases, 90% discounts on the price of the VM if you're willing to accept the fact that we could evict you from the VM for capacity reasons if we need to. So this is a good way to get the like the breakdown per VM of what it would what it might cost you. We also do have a pricing calculator. Um, this can be a little bit fiddly to work with because um, it's built entirely. Uh, entirely around the concept of how many hours are you running that VM? Um, and so for the purposes of the competition or the purposes of these bursty workloads, you may not really know exactly how many hours. Um, one of the key things that I would encourage you to do as you test um, before you even get access to your Azure um, environments is if you can break down approximately how many core hours each code's going to run, going to take you to run, then you can just take this dollars per core and multiply that out. And so that way, you know, one of the cool things about the cloud is if you've got a job that requires um, 10,000 core hours, right? You can, it's gonna cost you the same to run the, um, the same workload on 10,000 cores for one hour as it would to cost you, as it would to, to run the same VM or the same code on one VM or one core for 10,000 hours, right? So it's really about optimizing how big is my cluster um, and, and how much work does this specific code actually take? And then I can determine whether I wanna scale out or just kind of keep it smaller for, for um, the simplification of running the cluster. All right. so. Um, Sometime over the next month, I'm still waiting on access to the sandbox environment or the subscription for me to start deploying this stuff. Um, but sometime over the next month, your teams will receive logged in, login information for your own dedicated CycleCloud install. Um, this will be how you interact with Azure. You're not gonna have direct access to the Azure portal. Main reason for that is it makes it a lot easier for us to lock things down, both to keep the competition fair, but also to impose some security um, guidelines to make sure that you don't do silly things. Um, this is something that I run into every year. Um, this is less applicable for this, um, this particular use case because you probably will be using public IPs for your clusters, but please do not set password logins on your cluster. By default, we use SSH keys to connect to things. Um, because especially this year, since you will probably be accessing it via public IP, um, Azure's public IP space, similar to the other cloud providers, is probably one of the largest attack targets for hackers. Um, and so as soon as you enable a public IP and you put a password on your VM, the likelihood that your VM is going to get hacked goes up exponentially. I've seen VMs that have been up for a few minutes that get hacked. Um, and with passwords that you might think would be sufficient to. So just don't do it. Um, stick to SSH keys access. CycleCloud makes this really easy to do. Um, so just don't, don't add passwords to your VMs. 
Um, each of your teams will have their own single resource group, their own data, you know, VNets and subnets that you have control over. So you're not gonna be sharing those. The other thing too, that we'll need to make sure of um, leading up to the competition is that as you do your testing, you're gonna need to start to plan for how much quota you would like to have for the competition for specific VM types. Um, during testing, you're gonna have some access to kind of a, a grab bag of uh, different VM types and certain levels of quota. But um, when it comes to time for the competition itself, if you haven't requested the quota ahead of time, you may not have access to those VMs. Uh, and we'll get into what, that, what requesting that quota is gonna look like uh, at a later point after you guys have access to the environments. Uh, but again, I'll send out that information to your advisors um, probably about mid to late September. And then there'll be um, email announcements that go out both via Slack, but then also the, the Google group to let you know that that information has been sent out. Any questions around access and budget? I have a quick question. Are, are we gonna be set up it sounds like um, the same way we were set up last year where we, the students have to make an account that's part of your larger account. Um, yes, that's correct. Okay. okay. And the, the, the main reason for that is it's uh, because I only get like a, a certain fixed total budget to use for this and I have to go and set up environments for every single team. It's just a lot easier to host everything in the same subscription. The nice thing is we don't have as many teams this year. Uh, so I know last year and even in the past before that, you know, accommodating the quota requests was a little bit challenging. Um, with way fewer teams, it's gonna be a lot easier for me to get some of that whitelisted. Okay. Yeah, last year the students and this year they're making accounts with their UCSD identities. And, and it just took us a while last year to figure out how to move some of that work over to the other systems, but sure. we'll plan for that. Okay, thanks. Yep. Um, and again, we kind of already covered everything on this slide, but around why are we using CycleCloud and, uh, and not just giving you access to, you know, resource groups in uh, in the Azure portal. And it's really come, comes down to being easier for the committee, namely myself, to set up and manage these things, but it also makes it a little bit easier for the teams to get started. Um, if you're wanting to start to look at things ahead of time before you have access to it, um, PsychoCloud is a free product to download and play, away, play around with. Um, you would need your own Azure subscription, but um, at least for all of you students, you can get um, started with, I think, $100 credit uh, per month for free if you just go to the, the Azure website. So that might be another starting point. But if you want to read ahead and start looking at documentation, um, I did include a link to the docs here. And I'll add another bullet point here. This summer, we published a Microsoft Learn uh, two learning modules around using CycleCloud. So that may be another useful uh, place to get started to figure out how do I interact with this. And so with that, um, we've got about 13 minutes left or 12 minutes, I guess. Um, happy to take any questions that you might have either over stuff that we covered, stuff that I might have missed, general questions you have. Uh, I just had a question with CycleCloud. By yeah. looking at like the like the quick start of like installing it. It looks like I need an SSH key, but it says that I can just log into the application server using the public IP address, which is what the tutorial asked for. I think I can post the link. Yeah, so- See what I'm saying, so. And it seems like there's no authentication at all. Anyone can just connect to the public IP. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. It's authenticated using SSH keys. If you don't give us a, uh, an SSH key to use, you won't be able to log into the VM. Um, so that is one of those the details that I will include in instructions I'm not to your- I'm about, talking about the VM. I'm talking about the web interface, like the, what's it called, like the web yeah, the, server. Yeah. The web interface, the CycleCloud server is password protected. So that is a, 
a username and password that I will generate and distribute to your teams. Okay, I see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. But yeah, that's a great point though. As you look at the documentation and the quick start guides, you can skip the pieces about like going to the marketplace and deploying Cycle Cloud. You will get a Cycle Cloud install that's set up for you. You'll just have to give it a an SSH key that you want to use, a public key that you want to use, and then start to configure and deploy clusters within that. So you won't have to be setting up the, the Azure environment. Thanks, Ant. That was um, very informative. So we had a, a bunch of Q&A during the talk. We've got about 10 minutes left if anybody has any uh, questions on their mind at the moment. Um, but we also are, of course, uh, recording this and we'll post the recording on the webinars page soon afterwards. And uh, you'll be able to ask more questions via Slack as well. So it sounds like uh, people's immediate questions at least have been answered. So we're about 10 minutes before the end of the hour. We'll uh, wind up here. Thanks again, Andy, and thanks everyone for participating. All right, thanks everyone.